Welcome to the third part of the platformer tutorial for the default game engine. In the previous parts we set up our project and added first visual assets. Then we managed to add input handling and write some simple code to move our character when arrow keys are pressed. We also added basic animation handling and flipped our sprite to head in the movement direction. In this video we will learn how to handle collisions between our hero and the level and implement gravity mechanics while also structuring our code a little bit. We start with refactoring our hero script. First and most important rule of programming is to write human readable code. You will read this code for way more time than you spend writing it, even if you stick to my sluggish tutorial and explanations. Because of this, we will try to describe what we actually wrote not with comments, but with well thought function names. For now we only used functions that default understands and expects, and calls in certain conditions, the init and onInput functions in our case. You notice the functions take one or more arguments as an input and can eventually return some value or values as an output. For example, if we return true from onInput function, this will mean for the engine that the input is consumed and it should not be passed to the other scripts handling inputs. We only have one script so far that will be handling inputs, so we didn't return anything and that's okay. So let's convert our walking functionality into a function that I will call simply walk. I would like to call the function when input for the left or right arrow is detected, because it should behave in the same way, but the character walks in a different direction, so the direction could be an argument to this function. Separating a few lines of code into a function is really simple. First, copy the lines into the body of the walk function, then replace the copied lines with a call to this function and pass needed arguments. As for now, we define only one argument, direction. Just pass simply a positive one when we want to walk right, and negative one when we want to walk left. And now get to the body of the function as it will not work out of the box. But first modify a constant value of 5 that we are using in one of the branches to move our hero 5 pixels to the right. We need to use the same function when walking left, so multiply this value by our direction and it will result in walking 5 times 1 pixels so 5 pixels to the right when direction is positive and 5 times minus 1 so minus 5 pixels so actually 5 pixels to the left when direction is negative. Modify also the flip boolean value that we are using to flip the sprite into the direction of the movement. When we walk left the sprite should be flipped so the boolean value should be true then. We can also utilize our argument direction when it is negative so smaller than 0 we are walking left and this comparison results in being true, so it will flip our sprite. Convenient, because when direction is larger than zero, so we are walking right, the result of this comparison is false and it will not flip our sprite, which is originally facing right. Last thing before we test it out, always check if you have all values available in the scope of the used function. You see, we use a position variable, but as you remember, it was defined and initialized at the beginning of the onInput function. You can check on your own that when you run the game and move your character, the console will yell that you have an initialized value inside the walk function. Not literally, because it treats it as a global variable, but thankfully it is set to a default nil value, which means it was never initialized or reset on purpose and we have an error. It simply doesn't know such a variable in this scope. You can now either add another argument and pass this variable to the function and return from this function a modified position that we will later on use to set the new position, or you can just initialize and set the position inside our walk function and after modification set the new value to the game object. Of course then remove the same lines from the code in the onInput function. Now you can run and test your game. Let's at the beginning of our script initialize two local variables, direction right being equal to 1 and direction left being equal to minus 1. I intentionally use uppercase here because I want to emphasize that these are constant values and we don't want to change them in the code. We can use them as parameters to our work function and it will be now really readable. We're getting here slowly. Make the same operation with the animation handling. Write a function, animate, that will take action as parameter and move those lines to the body of this function. In this case, it is using values from the action table so the code can be untouched because we use the very same name as a parameter in the function definition. 
Replace the used lines with a single code to this function and pass action to it. Yes, code looks more clear now. Although flipping sprite should be in the function that is responsible for flipping and not walking, right? For a practice, try to separate flipping into a single responsibility flip function. You can utilize our direction as a parameter. Refactoring whenever possible will allow you not only to write a cleaner code, but will make it easier to find bugs and to reorganize it in the future. One more coding advice before we go to actual gravity. I like my code to be not nested when possible. Notice we duplicate our direction parameter to two functions now. Let's change it a bit so that we make a local variable direction and when action ID is equal to right, we initialize it with direction right constant, otherwise we initialize it with left. While speaking, I wrote it conveniently using Lua's lazy evaluation so that AND and OR operators here make our IF statement a one-liner. It works in the same manner as ternary operator in C++. Now just pass the direction variable as parameter to our two functions and remove the rest of the redundant now code. If you would like to, you can do the same inside the animate function. You can test it now. It is the same code but written differently, in my opinion in a more clear way. Let's get now to what was promised in this video. Gravity. First, we want our character to fall constantly in order to simulate gravity. We have two options. We could do it by using collision objects with dynamic collision type and let physics engines handle the rest. But this is not how most platformers are made. Platformers offer players mostly very tight control over the character and developers write the whole simulation for character movement and only utilize kinematic collision objects or ray casts to eventually observe the world around the character but react according to specific rules written in code. We will follow this path. First, we will separate the movement of character to the update loop. I explained how two types of the update functions in default works and for our platformer we will use fixed update function which is independent of the frame rate. We will utilize the basic physics formula for velocity. Velocity is a change of position in a given amount of time. In our case the fixed update function which is called 60 times per second lasts an amount of time marked as dt delta time and it is the second argument to the update function. If we want to modify the position of our object in the update loop, we would first get the current position and add an amount of translocation, a shift or simply a change of position. But when we have defined velocity, we can calculate the dx, which is a delta of position, in this case along the x-axis. We will use the formula so it will be velocity times delta time. We will assign it to the position variable created locally here and add the previous position. Our script won't be probably used by more than our hero player, but for you to be aware of our next decision, it could be if we could declare variables regarding its state in a self table that is bound to the instance. We will define then the velocity as a self.velocity variable, so velocity in the self table. Initialize it in the init function with vmav vector free, constructed with three zeros inside corresponding to x, y, and z. Now the position variable. Get the code we wrote in the walk function to our new update function. We get the position and then set it after changing it. I removed them from the walk function because we don't need them there anymore. Instead, change the velocity calculations inside to utilize our new self.velocity variable. Set its x coordinate to some value of base velocity multiplied by our direction. You can define the base velocity as a local variable having the whole script as a scope, so on top of our script, like we did with direction definitions. It's also a constant value, at least to the point when we would introduce some kind of power-up that speeds up our character. With direction we will do the same and move it to the self table. We need now in this walk function the self table, so make it a first argument and inside self we have velocity and direction, so we don't need to pass it here separately. After changing this function, change a call to this function in on input. Now we pass to this call the self table. We can set the newly calculated position according to the velocity and we can only change the velocity in the game. Here you can also change our previous local direction variable to self direction and use it in our call to the flip function. Now you can test it and check out what issues our changes caused. 
Silly issue is that we obviously didn't reset the velocity now, so the character slides forever in the selected direction. For now we only modified the x-coordinate of self velocity, so set it to 0 at the end of the update function. Test if it helped. If so, we are really good at coding now. So far we've been only changing our code and the functionality remained untouched. So to add gravity we will need to update velocity every frame. Again by adding the amount of change of velocity according to acceleration. And this acceleration is gravity. In our update function to our self velocity's y component, add it. Gravity times dt. In our case gravity will be only down the screen, so in negative y direction. We again made the same trick as earlier, but this time we convert our acceleration to velocity by multiplying it by dt. You can define it now as a constant local variable at the top of our script. We don't want the velocity to grow to insane values when the character will fall and that would happen now, so to avoid it, add a possibility to clamp the velocity to some maximum value. Simple clamp function could look like this and we could use it for minimum and maximum values. We can update our self velocity that y with a clamped value of it between some arbitrary edge values. When you run the game, the character should now be affected by gravity and start falling. Now it would be great if the character could stop on the ground instead of falling constantly, so let's add a simple level terrain with which our character will collide to stop falling. First, let's set up proper collision properties for our level. In our main collection, find our level game object, right click on it and add a component of type collision object. Change its type to static, as we will utilize it as a static floor and walls. For the collision shape property, select those three dots button and select our level tile map. It will use our tiles from the tile map to create a collision shape that is matching our level geometry, by magically using non-transparent pixels of each tile for the shape. In most of the cases it could be the same tile source as the visual image, but you can also use different ones. Open our tile source and in property collision select the same image we used to create the tile source. Editor will now highlight each of the tiles to a random color matching a default collision group. You can see it in outline and also you can add more groups here. Right click on the root called tile source and add collision group. Call it for example level and remember this name. We will use it to identify objects belonging to this collision group later on. Now when this group is selected in the outline, simply click on the tiles you want to add to this group. The selected tiles will be now highlighted with a different random color for the selected group. If you misclick and don't want to have given tile in the level collision group, deselect it in outline by clicking the tile source root and click on that unlucky tile to exclude it from the group. Recap. We assigned collision shape to our whole tile map and each further tile map we will create using this tile source and defined which tiles are matching the group that we called level. When you are done with it, get back to our main collection. Now click on our collision object and change the group to our level. This will be the name of the group of this collision object, so of the whole level geometry. Mask property is here to mark with which other groups this collision object can collide. It will be player. We can put it here now, but we need to define it. So let's do it. You know now how to add collision objects to game object. So add one to our hero game object. This time we won't utilize the geometry of our hero as it was made using atlas, not a tile source, and it would be impractical and not optimal to collide with the precise shape matching every pixel of this sprite. We will use a simpler collision shape. Default comes with three primitive shapes. Right click on our collision object for hero in the outline and select add shape. You see box, capsule and sphere. We can select a box. You can see it appeared both in the outline and in the editor as a simple rectangular shape. The best is you can use common editor tools to move, rotate or scale the collision shape. Or you can type in precise values in the properties pane. The useful default shortcuts for switching between move, rotate and scale tools are W, E and R key. You can of course change the shortcuts. 
If you are happy with your collision shape, matching more or less the visual sprite, select again the collision object in the outline and change its type to kinematic and the property group to, as you remember we put earlier, the player group and mask property to our level. Even though the engine is now detecting the collision between player and ground, we still don't react to this collision and because we were not using dynamic collision objects, it is not handled automatically by the physics engine as well. So get back to our hero script to write a code that will handle collision of our player collision object with level. In default, every collision sends a message to components of the parent game object. Our script is such a component that can receive it. So let's check what we get by writing onMessage function. It's another one lifecycle function that we removed when we didn't need it. So let's add it now back to the hero script. For now, just simply make a print of message ID and message that we could receive here. If we did everything correctly, when the character is following through the level, we should be receiving a bunch of collision messages visible in the console. As the player has a kinematic type collision object, we receive two messages, collision response and contact point response. In our case, the contact point response message has a lot of useful information, for example, normal vectors of the contact and distance to the contact point, which might be very useful for writing a collision handling later on. You see, if the player collides with the level, in the contact point response message we get a hash level in the other group field of the message table. Let's use this information to detect if we are touching ground or not. In our init function create a self that ground contact variable and initialize it with a false value. Now in the onMessage function check if we are receiving a message with message ID equal to hashed contact point response and if the other group is hashed level. If so, set the ground contact variable to true and velocity on y axis to zero. Now check out how it works. We have a small problem here, so we can very quickly fix it with adding a conditional in our update function. When the ground contact variable is true, we set the velocity on y axis to zero. This should prevent our hero from following for the level geometry now, so let's test it. Even though it's working and we have a reasonable gravity, it is not an optimal solution because we always reset the velocity on y-axis when the ground contact variable is true, so we can't possibly jump now or even later on fall to the lower platform. In the next video we will change it and write a compensation function that will compensate for this effect of falling slowly through the level and implement the jumping mechanics. For now get comfortable with the code we have so far and digest how collisions are working. If you need a more detailed video about collisions only, I can make one after the platformer tutorial series. Let me know in the comments and of course subscribe if you haven't yet. And check out how you can support me to deliver those videos even faster to the community. For now, I'm very thankful to my current sponsors and supporters and we can wrap with a quick see you soon.